at its peak in March 2021, it was valued at $95 billion, could not make a dent in India. It had a great product, maybe. Uh, it had a great untapped opportunity in India. And it didn't really have much competition and yet it failed. Why? There's an internet quip that was very popular. And it goes something like this. The Amazon of China is Alibaba. The Uber of China is Didi. The Google of China is Baidu. And the Apple of China is Xiaomi. In India, the thinking was, the Amazon of India is Amazon. The Uber of India is Uber. And the Google of India is Google. And the Apple of India is Apple. In today's episode of 2x2, we are going to discuss why Stripe couldn't become the Stripe of India. Before I go ahead with the show, I'd like to tell you that there's something new happening today. Another piece of 2x2's personality has come together. From here on now, you'll be listening to a brand new theme music of 2x2 composed by Nivin Rafael. Personally, I think it has a vibrant energy that sticks to the theme of the show, which is to have serious conversations about topics that matter. And it also channelizes the curiosity with which we approach our discussions. I don't want to overdo it and explain it, so I'll let the music speak for itself. Let's begin. Today's episode begins with two blog posts and I'm going to read out what the two blog posts are and you can spot what's common to both of them. Here's the first one and this is from three months ago. The entire blog post is about 150 words but I'll just read the first paragraph. Starting in May 2024, Stripe services will be invite only in India. This means our businesses from India will not be able to sign up for a new Stripe account through our website and will instead need to request an invite. We will only be able to support a select number of businesses with a focus on international expansion for the time being. The rest of the blog post is about, you know, all of this and expands on it. This is the first blog post. Now I'll come to the second blog post from seven years ago in December 2017. And here's the first paragraph of that blog post. Today, we are starting an invite-only beta for Stripe in India with a small group of companies. These businesses will help test our platform in the Indian market and provide feedback on features that we'll need to build to support all Indian businesses looking to accept online payments and run their companies on Stripe. It seems like invite only is a rite of passage for Stripe. Stripe entered India with an invite only step. So it seems reasonable to assume that they're leaving India on the basis that it's going invite only again. Over the last seven years, Stripe, the world's mightiest fintech company, which is currently valued at around $70 billion, I have two wonderful guests with me. First, I have Arundhati Ramanathan, Deputy Editor at The Ken. Say hi, Arundhati. Hello. <laughs> of course, I'm biased, but Arundhati is India's preeminent fintech reporter. She's demonstrated it over a career of eight years at The Ken. Uh, Arundhati has written over like 200 plus stories at The Ken, but... I want to ask you, Arundhati, what is the first fintech story that you wrote and when was it? Uh, it was right after demonetization. It was in 2017, I think, uh, just when the dust of demonetization was settling. Hmm. Um, and it was a story about how uh, Beam was the upsetter of all plans and that Beam could, uh, you know, have the product that would challenge even phone pay and the bank apps. Obviously, it turned out to be very different. But uh, that was one for the ages. <laughs> when someone asks me, how do I understand the history and evolution of fintech in India? I just tell them, go to the Ken, search for Arundhati's <laughs> name, go back to her first story and start from there and go forward. Uh, my second guest is Vikram Bhatt. Um, Vikram is one of India's most accomplished product leaders. And I'm just going to read out the list of companies where he was in product leadership roles in just the last 15 years. His entire career is much longer. I'm only sticking to the last 15 years. VP at Mintra, CPO at Altya Birla uh, Online Fashion, CPO at Xstep Foundation, CPO at Lending Cart, CPO at Capillary Technologies, CPO at Good Worker, and most recently, 
CPO at Setu, which is a fintech company that enables API-based infrastructure for financial services. Am I getting that right, Vikram? Yeah, that's right, PGK. That's right. Uh, so at Setu, uh, on his LinkedIn, he writes that he launched data inside products using the account aggregator framework and introduced merchant acquiring UPI solutions to improve payment processes and user experiences. So Vikram has not just seen and witnessed, he's actually really built out products as India's fintech changed and morphed over the last few years. And what has that experience been, Vikram? Doing it across a range of companies and sectors, etc. If I asked you to sum up how fintech in India has changed over the last few years, what would you say? Yeah, and I think uh, uh, fintech in India is truly about democratizing, uh, you know, access to financial services and payment methods. Uh, it's really about that, right? If you look at UPI, uh, which is, I, I think, the single biggest revolution in fintech in India, hmm. I think that has made digital payments accessible to hundreds of millions of people hmm. uh, overnight, right? Uh, and uh, I would, I, I can safely say that India has leapfrogged uh, fintech innovations compared to the West. Now, obviously, how it has done it and what it has led to is also, you know, they're all uh, valid topics of discussion. But I think uh, it's uh, the, the growth of fintech in India has been truly revolutionary. Uh, glad to have been part of it in some small way. Uh, but I want to go back to your previous uh, comment. Uh, Arundhati, definitely, she is like the chat GPT of finance. Uh, <laughs> That is like the biggest uh, insult you can throw <laughs> at Arundhati on her birthday. I mean, this is the can most... I, I, no, no, wait, wait. The insult is always on those who like chat GPT by itself and, and, and now wait, valued wait, at $100 million. I'm not, I'm not finished. I have not heard her hallucinate. So that's 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 where she beats uh, chat GPT Thank hands you guys. Down, very right? kind. So, anyway, yeah. <laughs> so uh, I'm worth $100 uh, billion. Sorry? Some worth yeah, hundred yeah. million. Yeah, ChatGPT is worth hundred billion dollars. Stripe is only worth seventy billion dollars. That of course is my co-host Rohan. Uh, Rohan, say hi. Is there anything that you want to talk about fintech in India? I'm just glad to be here, and uh, I'd also like to welcome our first woman leader on the podcast, Arundhati. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you, and I hope you have many more women on yes, the show. Yes, I want to actually use this opportunity to say. If you're a woman leader or executive and, and if you've heard en enough of our episodes or you've read the can, you know the sectors that we cover and you're open to coming on two by two, you know the kind of conversations that we have, right? Please do write to us. We'd love to have more women guests and leaders on the show. We're at two by two at the ken.com or any of us at our first name at the ken.com. Um, all right, so I'll just get started. And I think the first thing that I want to talk about is we know we want to talk a lot about Stripe and probably the reason, I think the first thought a lot of people have when they listen to why Stripe did not succeed in India is something to do with, well, I'm sure there was some regulatory stuff. And yes, there was regulatory stuff. We'll come to that. But I want to cut back and just talk about the product itself. So I'm going to cut back to 2017. Now, this is the time just when Stripe enters India. They're a global giant. They're valued at $7 billion. Practically the default product anywhere in the world for collecting payments from startups and companies. In fact, at that point in time, uh, one of these analysts, his name was Benedict Evans, he basically says that Stripe entire proposition is they have levied a 3% tax on the future of the internet because the transaction charge that they would take for any kind of transaction online would be around 2.9% to 3%. And so essentially it was a future on the entire internet itself. And I know that as a product, Stripe is an extremely interesting product, devoid of India. And I thought I'll just ask you, Vikram, like, is there something that you want to talk about? What makes Stripe so special as a product? And what really like made it happen? Yeah. Now, I think uh, uh, Stripe's early years and the way it went about building product uh, is truly a, a case study for yeah. most. Uh, Sorry, I want to interrupt you. I think one of the things that you told us before we started is that you said that at Setu, you looked at Stripe as an inspiration as well. So I'm sure that as a product, you have a lot of things to say about why is it such an inspiration? Product. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, at Setu, uh, we thought very similarly hmm. uh, about our customer segments, right? And the pain points or use cases that we're trying to solve for, hmm. right? Uh, so essentially, we were looking at startups in India. We were looking at startups which wanted to kind of quickly, uh, you know, get their payment rails up and running. Uh, so the idea was to really, you know, kind of uh, focus on developers, create developer-friendly documentation, create sandboxes, you know, where developers could kind of, you know, get uh, started and, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, hit and the road running. And these are the things that without... Stripe was known for and was really... Uh, absolutely. Great. So let me get back to, you yeah, know, yeah, uh, Stripe, right? So I think the way Stripe went about building its product, it's almost a textbook uh, case study for product builders, hmm. right? Uh, because uh, if you look at, at the time, um, you know, there were many other payment companies like PayPal, and so on, who are basically, uh, you know, who had, you know, amazing market share. Uh, so it was very difficult for somebody to think of somebody other than a PayPal for enabling, say, internet commerce. Hmm. Uh, and then uh, Stripe came along, right? Uh, so what did they do very differently, right? I, I think what they did very differently was they deeply studied the market and they looked at some emerging areas of the market hmm. uh, to kind of focus on, right? Obviously, when you're entering a market where there are well-established players already, right? Hmm. You have to look for unsolved for use cases, right? Unsolved for problems. Mm. Uh, you cannot kind of introduce the same market and say, maybe I'll price it lower, uh, right? And expect to win. Right? Mm. Uh, and a lot of people try and do that. They don't win in the end. They may, you know, struggle for a long time, but they don't win in the end. And Stripe thought very differently about mm. approaching the market, right? Mm. So they tried to focus on unsolved problems, right? Uh, and uh, of course, there's a bit of timing as well because... When they were looking at building product, essentially the internet was growing. Uh, transactions on the internet were significantly growing year after year. Uh, and uh, you had a lot of these startups which were beginning to uh, grow their online businesses, offer products you know, online. And uh, a lot of these startups uh, being nimble and you know, being agile, they obviously had developers who were building the startup from scratch. Now, uh, so then they started saying, hey, you know, these users look very different from your traditional payment users. Your traditional payment users were your finance departments, were your banks, right? And the way you sold to them, uh, the way you offered the value proposition was very different, you know, compared to how you would say approach developers in a startup, mm -hmm. right? And obviously these startups needed to be agile and nimble, which meant they couldn't waste a lot of time getting up and running, right? Uh, so that's where these guys came and said, can we just offer them a few lines of code to plug into their applications and immediately get started without any bureaucracy, without any bureaucracy or hassle, right? Uh, which meant, you know, uh, even before, you know, official contracts were signed, your startups could kind of, you know, pick these few lines of code from Stripe's website and, you know, uh, get running. And I think that made a huge difference because that kind of completely changed the way, you know, products were introduced in the market and used. Right. So they were one of the first ones to kind of focus on developers as the user audience uh, and, and as decision makers as well and kind of really focus that product around them. Right. That doesn't mean Stripe is exactly where it was when it started off. Right. Of uh, post startups, they started focusing on marketplace platforms, enterprises, and obviously, you know, that GTM approach, uh, you know, uh, changed. Uh, but that's go to market go to market uh, sorry yeah gtm go to market uh, uh, tactics changed right but having said that one of the philosophies that they've kept with uh, throughout their journey is focusing on startups focusing on hard problems you know focusing on what really made them successful so they haven't lost that trait which made them successful so because one of the things that happens uh, with most companies that make it big is as they start focusing on enterprises they forget some of the uh, I would say uh, some of the things that really made them successful early on, you know, when working with smaller companies. Right. And that's something that I think Stripe has managed to continue doing, right? So if you look at their customer base, it's not now skewed completely towards the enterprise. It has a lot, it still manages to, you know, focus on startups because that's where, you know, you get uh, insights into raw problems that you need to take care of. Yeah, I think I'll second what you said because there are two, three other aspects of Stripe as well, which is that number one, um, you spoke about documentation and you're right, their API documentation, if you want to integrate, if you go to their website, it's actually the gold standard. It's been the gold standard for a long time. Like if you're ever writing any kind of APIs that you want to expose externally and you want to write it for developers and you want to say, what does it look like? People always say, just go to the Stripe website, look at it and try to replicate it. Um, uh, Arundhati, over the last like eight years, you've had an opportunity to talk to several founders, several leaders, several executives. Does Stripe come up? And in what context does Stripe come up? Uh, not anymore. Okay. But in 2016, uh, when when they were still invite only in India, I think they had the right to win. Stripe could have been the Stripe of India. Because back then, the online payment 
aggregate a system or the ability to accept payments, which is what these companies do. It was still not where it is today. Um, India was still net banking focused, card focused, a lot like the US where cards are predominant. Here also cards were uh, uh, a large part of how one would make payments. And back then you had like who? Bill Desk, which was still utility focused. Then you had one then you had Citrus Pay, which was still this crappy startup, which was then bought by PayU. Then you had a few more uh, people pay. like uh, CC Avenue, right? Uh, coming to RazorPay, RazorPay and Stripe almost launched at the same time in India. RazorPay set up in 2015. Stripe was here in 2016, uh, right? And I remember back then that RazorPay was actually worried about Stripe coming into the market because they exactly knew what Stripe could do. Both came out of Y Combinator, both are Sequoia funded. At that point, RazorPay just had about 20 million in funding. I mean, it's not just 20 million, it is 20 million. But, uh, you know, Stripe could easily outspend them. It had these great set of engineers and all of that, right? So Stripe did have the right to win uh, India and the uh, payment aggregator space. Um, and like you said, their strategy was to grow with startups, identify some of those uh, uh, high growth companies and kind of latch on to them, right? Like what it did with Shopify, Uber, that's what it did there. And in India, I think even before uh, I could be uh, uh, off here, but I think even before they officially came to India, they were letting companies do cross-border payments. So that's how some of the merchants, like say the crowdfunding platform Keto, was already working with them. So they thought that, you know, they could work with uh, the global startups that were going to set up in India and kind of take those relationships and grow in India. But but I don't think it panned that way. And we will soon see why as we uh, go along in the discussion. But being a superior product isn't all that it takes to win in India. You have to adapt and you have to adapt fast especially for the Indian context and for the Indian market. And Stripe did not press this advantage or use its resources fast enough and sort of fell behind in the race. Vikram, earlier right. you were saying something about Stripe's product being the best and you said something about products are always best in context, right? Exactly, right. Tell us more about what did you mean by the India context. So, I mean, it uh, goes back to what PGK was saying. You know, what makes... What, 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 do, what do people think... Uh, of, you know, the superior attributes of Stripe products, which is developer experience, uh, consistent pricing, uh, you know, uptime and so on, right? Now, all those kind of are superior within a context. Okay. Right. So in the US where self-service is important, in the US where, you know, at least some of the larger startups have basic, uh, you know, skill sets to incorporate those lines of code into their apps. In the US where uptimes are probably already pretty high, Card penetration uh, is high. Yeah. So it makes a lot of sense. And to regulation is be not that disruptive. I think that's a very important exactly, thing. Exactly, right? So which allows companies to kind of, you know, apply these lines of code and get started, yeah. right, quickly. Uh, so those were really the differentiating factors which made Stripe what it was in the US. But the context in India, as we discussed, is very different, right? So I would say Indian companies still operate at lower levels of Maslow's hierarchy where, you know, value and cost is still very important. Sure. Right? Indian consumers are probably one of the most value-focused value, value focused, uh, globally, right? That explains why I think every merchant wants like two, three, four gateways uh, um, uh, processing payments and exactly. not relying on just one. While Stripe is used to being the only gateway uh, when they work with uh, merchants because it helps them add products, drop products and, and just give a much better service. Uh, uh, but that's also because in India, else. you can't take reliability for granted. Correct. If you're dependent on just one gateway or payment partner and that payment partner will face issues, it's it's almost guaranteed, right? I mean, yeah, in what fact, do you do? I just want to come back to a fundamental part of product building, right? Which is uh, while you look at competitors, while you look at, you know, benchmarks out there in the industry, it's always important to apply context, right? Because your user segments may not be the same, right? What your user segments value may be different from what your competitors' user segments value, even though the product offering looks kind of the same. Sure. Right? So the user segments that you're going after and the problems that they have, right, are what will make you successful. Got it. You know, I know, sorry, Praveen, just to kind of close out this point, the best example that I always use for Indian context is self-driving cars. Okay, right? great. You have like 
you know you will have tesla and elon musk touting full self driving in china now the price of a full self driving car is like you know the new one that gone launched couple of days back is 20000 which is 16 lakh rupees which in india is not that expensive right now you imagine like hey self driving cars working in the us self driving cars working in china why can't we have self driving cars so in here india the first, context here the first question that, that would get asked is what's the ground clearance <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to move right like <laughs> No I think the question I was going to ask I mean you answered it partly is that can you think of examples of global companies when they come to India they have understood this context very well you know can you think of any examples like I know we already spoken about say Amazon Amazon is a great example maybe Uber is a great example I'm not sure were there like companies who understood this and were ready to change who they fundamentally were yeah in order to like yeah try no, to win I think India? uh Amazon would be a good example. It's it's actually tough to think of good examples. And even talking about Amazon, I remember the Ken article about Amazon fashion. Yeah, <laughs> of course. Uh-huh. Right, uh where we kind of critiqued uh their play there. But essentially, uh it's it's actually understandable that global companies, especially the ones based in the west, have a tough time adjusting to developing markets, right? Because my assumption would be they believe they're the best at what they do right and they believe they have the most evolved needs you know right? what beats uh, me is that you know they have all this great talent right but um, and we were speaking about how stripe is a superior product but actually as, even as a product in context as vikram says yes in context yeah. right but like i remember people telling me that their 2fa like two factor authentication stack wasn't as good um, right their uh, settlement uh wasn't as good so those things did break down which is very core product features didn't really work in india so uh despite having all that engineering talent so which it, is it why i said you know sense. they should have probably taken the same approach that they took to building stripe in the us right which is ground actually up. you know employ grounds actually up research up and your, innovation which i think pay you did right it just bought uh citrus pay and it actually did that in india um which which makes it a much more which is an example yeah. of a global company that's in payments that's a good point so the Payu answer is, is make in india <laughs> yes absolutely <laughs> well at least understand india before you yeah. make you know yeah. i think uh, very because important because our payment needs i mean just look at the number of payment products we have it's insane um and as someone was telling me that for different ticket sizes we use different payment products yeah. for different I, use yeah. cases we use different payment products right like you would a uh, uh, food app would have more upi but a stock broking app would need more mandates to be set up right uh, it's insane so i i see what's happened with stripe in india like simplified at the simplest like you know at the highest level to here's a company which globally spent a lot of time thinking about the future of payments and the internet and solved it and it came to india it was unprepared for the fact that india would be the inverse of that where the indian fintech ecosystem of regulators competitors consumers etc would essentially rewire the entire global payment system ground up so stripe was fundamentally it just couldn't handle it like you know i mean it's i don't think it's pride right it's like you're coming to a country and the country is now in many senses rewriting the rules of payments for the rest of the world right do you really want to be part of it and if you do want to be part of it i guess then it's a longer haul yeah. right you and just can't they could have done it if they had the resources like if they uh, wanted to but then yeah. it goes back to vikram's point of Where's was it revenue? worth it yeah which is the point that you know someone at stripe made to me that they could have got the resources they could have uh, done localization uh, a lot sooner than what really happened but they didn't they could not get the resources from san francisco so what if stripe so, says that you know what what if stripe is right and saying like you know guys just not invest anymore just wait it out <laughs> we just come back and acquire one of the larger indian <laughs> players at some point makes sense which is what they've also in the blog post they've said that they will reevaluate this and i think in 2025 so it's not like they're out of it completely i mean anyway, i, th- it's I for think all they're out of it for all practical purposes they but are. why why can't they spend a couple of billion dollars to just acquire an indian uh payment company at some point it will be easier all the regulations are in place customers are in place flows are in place that's a provocative thing we'll wait we'll come to that <laughs> we'll come to that but before that i just want to say one thing for the record that 
Till now, we have been discussing and saying, oh, when Stripe basically had to do this localization thing in India, they did not have the resources. It took them 18 months, etc. But to Stripe's credit, here's what actually happened. Stripe actually went, took this localization thing seriously, the headquarters of Stripe, and they went ahead and redid all of it. But in order to comply with it, Stripe had to redo its entire payment infrastructure, which means that it did it completely ground up, sitting in HQ, and it took 300 engineers. And that's because Stripe and headquarters, the way how they got convinced was, they looked at India and said, well, India is just one out of several markets where this is happening. They looked at it and said, well, we're seeing signs of this localization happening in Turkey. We're seeing signs of this happening in Indonesia. So we might as well solve this problem for everybody in a generic way. And that is what took them all this uh, time. Scope creep. Scope creep, yes. But on but the executive whom, again, from Arundhati's story that I've taken this from, quotes and says, to their credit, Stripe disrupted its global product roadmap to make way for India. The irony, however, was that when Stripe could finally add its UPI product to the mix in 2021, it didn't have a market to launch it in. Because at that point in time, UPI had completely taken over, cards had completely gone away. Vikram, what do you think is hap was happening inside Stripe? Do you think this was a... No, I think uh, this is actually um, one of the fundamental reasons why small startups can flourish. Right? Uh, <laughs> because they don't need 18 months and 300 engineers and a yeah, global product exactly. roadmap to... Right? Uh, so, I mean, if you look at a typical, you know, decision-making process in a large company, right? Uh, you have revenue targets, right? Uh, you have growth targets. Now, obviously, you will try and figure out which are the easiest ways of achieving those revenue targets, right? So, you will always have, you know lower hanging fruits compared to a risky new bet that you have to take. Sure. Right. Uh, so unless you have, you know, uh, maybe a visionary or maybe a slightly lunatic kind of person pushing for that risky bet, it will not, you know, a large company will not go after such bets with a lot of gusto. Right. That's a fundamental reality, which is why you have innovation largely coming from startups. Oh, right. and like, sorry, have, yeah. to, this, to this point, I think this in the last episode of Google Pay, we also hypothesized that Google Pay came about in India because of Caesar Sen Gupta's bet on it. So you had, quote unquote, that visionary slash lunatic. You need lunatic. that executive sponsorship. Exactly. Right? Or you need, right? uh, some, so, yeah. Yeah, you need that somebody driving that uh, risky bet. right? But if nobody is driving it and it's kind of looked at you know equally amongst other bets, then it's not likely to get the attention and resources. Yeah, right, companies uh, like Stripe tend to have this hub approach, right, where engineers are sitting in like five different hubs and allocated to different markets. So, And as the fintech opportunity in India gets more and more crowded, Stripe seems to have scaled down on their India ambitions and gone back to their invite-only model with which they entered the market in 2017. Only this time, the context seems quite different. Is that as time went by, all the upsides started diminishing and the downsides started getting deeper and deeper. Like you had greater costs in order to comply. You had to invest a lot into practically rebuilding all of your stack. Then you have all of these other things because if you have expectations of, you know, physical KYCs, etc. happening, then at this point in time, the only thing that is left is the downside of it. If you get something wrong is quite high. So you might as well not get... Yeah, and deep just deep want deep. to add one more, right? If you look at their product expansion strategy as well, they're beginning to get a lot deeper into not just payment-related workflows, but all financial workflows. Okay. Right? Uh, so globally, you mean? Globally. Globally, yeah. okay. Right? So, as a CPO at Stripe, I may look at growth in those areas as being much more attractive than the growth and monetization and payments area in a place like India. Interesting, right? Uh, right? So it's it's like a portfolio approach. Yeah. Like where do you put your next dollar of investment into? And if you're going to put it into India, you better have a strong reason to convince the board as to why that one dollar put into India will eventually become two dollars in revenue. Hmm. Hmm. At last count, we had close to thirty-five licensed payment aggregators. I was just checking RBI yesterday. Hmm. Uh, Twenty-three more are going to apply to become one. They're in principle. 
and a hundred more applications were returned, right? And uh, one of those, I think, uh, Zomato returned its, I didn't want to be a payment aggregator. So everybody wants to be in this business. Yeah, I mean, uh, Vikram was saying so, that how startups are basically going on the road and picking people to build stacks, but it looks like those same people on the road are now applying to RBI to say, hey, I also want to be a payment aggregator. <laughs> because if you can save a few basis points by doing it yourself, why not? Exactly. Hmm. So what you're really saying is that for most companies, like let's say if you're looking at a Zomato or an Amazon or a Flipkart, as an example, I'm not saying these are necessarily the companies that have applied for it. They are paying a certain cut to payment aggregators for transactions that happen. So it comes back to your earlier point, Vikram. I'm sure someone who is in these companies, leaders are looking around and saying, we have so many engineers, why can't we throw 10 of them and ask them to build something? Yeah, which is what PhonePay did, right? And it took away 20%, like it launched, it said no cost, and it took away 20% of uh, uh, the uh, small startups. Sorry, who are we talking about? PhonePay, phone which pay. became a oh, payment aggregator, okay. mm. uh, in addition to everything else it does. Mm. It said, I will also do payment aggregation, mm. it's good for its business. And it uh, offered it at zero cost. Uh, forget uh, 15 basis points, yeah. right? And yeah, it took and away the market. This also ties back to the fact that, okay, one is we are a low trust economy. Second is we are still a highly value oriented economy, which means margins across the board are going to be much thinner than in Western markets, right? Which means you need a larger portfolio or bouquet of products and services that you need to offer to kind of, you know, a slice here, a slice here, a exactly, slice here. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. I, I mean, to Arundhati, your point about phone pay, you know, I mean, as you were speaking, I was like, look, phone pay is like the exact opposite of Stripe. Stripe starts from this place where I'm going to make 3% of every transaction and therefore they look at India and this makes no sense. Phone pay starts by I'm not going to make money on UPI. <laughs> I just got to figure out how to make 15 basis points more, 25 basis points more, 10 basis points more. So they keep adding. That's why they're like, we are going to offer payment aggregator at 0% because we'll figure out how to make money and through our various 80% services. And 80% is going to happen through UPI and if that's going to Absolutely. increase. Absolutely. Right. So... Phone pay is the alter ego <laughs> of Stripe. But there's another company we haven't spoken about a lot, which is which eventually is the Stripe of India today, Paytm. which is Razorpay. Okay, fair enough. Hmm. Did you just say Paytm? I mean, I was thinking... I, I feel compelled to add a star and say, Vijay Shekhar Sharma, the founder of Paytm, is one of the investors in the Ken. Right? But the Stripe of India, to me at least, is Razorpay because I think they've done an outstanding job. I mean, there have been ups and downs, but on the whole... I think they've done an outstanding job of execution in India for the Indian context. Absolutely. Hard to disagree with that. I think Be it in terms of the number of features they bring out, um, the, their success rates, uh, right? It, it, it definitely is. Uh, I so, think, so I think Sequoia and Y Combinator will at least be happy that the you know one of it one of the stripes wannabe the stripes became Sequoia. the stripe <laughs> <laughs> true that yeah yeah peak 15 rather yes yes okay. interestingly just to um, so stripe is in 46 countries and it's only in india and indonesia that it's on an invite only basis so it's in countries like latvia and lithuania and you know croatia but two big markets two regulatorily very hard to crack markets it's gone in white only and i think that says a lot about both stripe and I'm guessing that i mean uh, vikram you could probably talk more about but in general southeast asia also has a lot of similarities with india in terms of number of payment instruments complexity small ticket sizes again increasing regulatory focus just like i think a lot of southeast asian countries are operating at probably like a three to four year lag of india in terms of regulation so a lot of the things like upi which came to india are also eventually going to happen there right so a function of being a low trust economy right uh, in all these countries you have the same problem right uh, kyc is a big issue Identifying, uh, you know, verifying identities is a big issue. Uh, plus in Indonesia, you know, uh, the question is, what is the online startup scene there? You know, is that uh, growing as That's fast? true. The SEA e-commerce slash internet boom has sort of petered out. It's petered boom, out yeah. and it has a, a crazy geography. Right? That's it's true. That's like true. Hundreds like of islands or thousands right. of islands. That's right. So that makes e-commerce by itself uh, a challenging proposition. Yeah, there. I, I'll just come back quickly to Razorpay. I think apart from all the commonalities, we spoke about Stripe and Razorpay. We spoke about their valuation. We spoke about how they're backed by both Y Combinator and Sequoia. Uh, I think one quote that struck me when I was reading this somewhere was that Stripe's local 
team in India was essentially quite frustrated because they had grown after a lot of fighting with Stripe Global. They managed to grow their engineering team, I think, from like, say, 10 or 12 people to closer to like 30 people. And in that same period of time, they were looking at Razorpay and Razorpay went from like, I think, 200 people, I mean, the overall, to almost like a 2,000, 3,000 person team. So the scale at which they were competing and up against, which comes back to your point about labor being much cheaper, it's easier to just like get engineers from the street, so to speak, and ask them to do things. That was what they were really confronted but, by. But also it's not that, right? For Razorpay India is a make or break market. For PhonePay India is a make or break market. For Stripe India is one among many countries, right? So Razorpay's valuation is kind of almost entirely, now I'm not saying 100%, but very close to that number, dependent on their success, market share, revenue in India, right? So they're obviously going to do much, much more uh, than what Stripe does. And that's just, I think, the imbalance. Thank you for listening to 2x2. What you just listened to is a short version with some of the most interesting parts that emerged as part of an hour and a half long discussion. You can get access to listen to the entire conversation with a premium subscription to The Ken or get a subscription to 2x2 on Apple Podcasts. We are a new podcast and we are also trying out a lot of new things and would love to hear from you about what's working, what's not working and what more can we do to make every episode better for you. Please write to us at 2 by 2 at theken.com and let us know what you think about it. This episode was produced by Anushka Mukaji and my colleague Hari Krishna is the lead writer and researcher for 2 by 2 Our resident sound engineer Rajiv CN is the audio producer for this episode.